Welcome back, everybody. So now we have part two of the Michael Tellinger story. Today he's going to be sharing many of the, some of the, showing some of the artifacts he's actually found at some of these amazing sites around South Africa, and some more more information about the energy and some of the kind of technological magic that these people who lived here thousands of years ago may have been working with. So it's going to be a revelatory talk, I think, this one. So please keep a beady eye on this one. It's going to be amazing. So please give a warm welcome to Michael Tellinger. Thanks, everybody. Welcome back. Right, I'm going to, I've got a lot of information. I'm going to do this really at a pace. Also, because I know that the, you know, sitting and listening to this kind of stuff can get a little bit overwhelming. So I'm going to try and entertain you at the same time, to the best of my ability. Yes. We learned that uh, there are at least 10 million mysterious stone circular ruins in Southern Africa. I showed you the evidence of that. That forces us to rethink everything we know about our human history. The word mythology actually in its original form means sworn testimony of past events, not imaginary or made up stuff. And then just a list of other things that we learned. We know less about our human origins than is permissible by the laws of physics. I showed you that. Uh, 10 to the minus 34, Planck's constant. We know less than that. And uh, that is a very important thing for us to consider. These are not simple things for us to wrap our heads around and our minds around. Um, history of planet Earth is mysterious, far more mysterious than we could ever, ever possibly imagine. And you've seen a lot of information by the various speakers about that. Everything is connected. Sorry, frequency is the backdrop to the universe, and frequency seems to be this weird source of energy that drives everything so that we can actually me measure it and detect it in the electromagnetic universe, as we call it. Everything is connected through this invisible magical thing called consciousness. The evidence of antiquity is all around us. I think you've seen enough evidence of that from the various presenters and speakers here yesterday and in your lives before. Evidence of advanced ancient technology is all around us, and I'm going to share some of that with you today. Now, just to remind you that some of the ancient artifacts that we believe were energetic devices and energy generating devices is a very interesting photograph showing some interesting waves, magnetic waves coming out of the Great Pyramid. Now, there's technology, photographic technology, that you can do all these wonderful things with. We'll be doing much more of this at the ruins and at Adam's calendar in the weeks to come. Um, and then I'm going to drop a bombshell on you. How many geologists in the audience today? Show of hands. Okay. <laughs> I'll just have to, you'll just have to take my word for this. Stonehenge is a lot older than anyone's ever possibly imagined. Much, much older. And I dropped this on the, the people at Megalithomania last year just to show you some geological uh, evidence that I believe irrefutably shows that we're dealing with something extremely old, not just a few thousand years old, but hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years old. Now, for this you need to accept certain things, and that is we need to accept that that stone lying flat over there used to be the twin of this one here. Apparently we get told that that's what it was, and they were joined by a lintel across the top. And then that one fell over and broke in three places. Well, when I walked in there, I was shocked to see this because I work with rocks every day of my life and I know what a fresh break looks like. I know what a break looks like that's a few years old and a few hundred years old and so forth. When you look at the break in that stone there, this is sarsen stone, apparently extremely hard, the erosion on that break is not something that would have happened in a few hundred, even in a few thousand years. So from a geological perspective, the stones do not lie to us. And you can see that we're dealing with something that's taken an extremely long time to erode. So wrap your heads around that, and I would put that in a few hundred thousand years at least to get to that kind of level of erosion. The next very interesting um, phenomenon is this particular lintel. Now, no self-respecting builder uh, or architect will put a lintel up that's got a crack in it. They drag this from 300 miles away or whatever and put it up there. My guess is that that lintel was intact when it was put up there. Look at the erosion around that crack. That is spectacular. That's not something that erosion did not happen in a few thousand years. That's an extremely long period of exposure that that kind of erosion can happen. My take on Stonehenge, we're dealing with something that's 500,000 years old. 
Make, you know, do with that information what you want. Remember, yesterday I started off by saying, don't believe a word I say. Take the information and go and do your own research and uh, then, you know, reach your own conclusions. I'm just presenting you with some interesting facts and some theories and conclusions that I've reached by putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Sometimes I like to uh, tell people I, li uh, I do what the guys in CSI do. I just follow the clues and follow the evidence, and then I reach my conclusions based on the clues and the evidence. And there is really no other way. And right now, what I'm sharing with you is some of my conclusions and, and the evidence that I'm finding. Right, the other important thing is that what we left off yesterday, what happened to all these millions of stone ruins that um, were scattered throughout Southern Africa? Well, remember yesterday you saw in compelling evidence from Graham and from um, Andrew about this event called the flood around you know, 11, 12,000 BC in that time period, more or less. It seems that all ancient civilizations have a flood in their culture. They all talk about a giant flood that destroyed not only their civilization, but probably the world. Well, I believe it was that same flood that around that same period came across Southern Africa and wiped out this advanced, technologically advanced gold mining civilization. And you can see it by the amounts of sediment on all the stone ruins that you see. We only see a fraction of the stone ruins, the circular stone ruins and the roads, the channels that connect them, the terraces. We only see a small fraction that have been exposed. The rest of it is still covered under the soil. And here are just some pieces of evidence that, that show you that. Here's another beautiful example of the sedimentation along the, the mountaintops and the sides of the mountain. Remember that some of the best um, preserved examples of these stone structures are on tops of the mountains. And uh, they've been, uh, there's been reports from um, people all over the place that they found seashells, sea sands being found in there, and fossilized fish in these stone circles. And that tells a story in itself. So, <clears throat> all of this activity in Southern Africa is all about gold. And this is the one very important thing. Human history cannot be separated from our obsession with gold. In Genesis 2, when Adam was alone on earth, now you've got to think about this. There's no Eve. She has not yet been fashioned from his rib. Adam is alone. This dude walking around, don't know what he was doing. But God comes to him and says, hey, there's a place called Havilah. And uh, it's a really cool place. There's a lot of the, the, the land is good. There's a lot of water. And by the way, buddy, there's gold. Now, you've got to ask yourself, why would God want to tell Adam that there's gold in this place called Havilah? And I want you to go there because I want you to dig it for me, you bugger. Something like that. And uh, wherever there are gold mines, there are stone circles. And that seems to be the pattern wherever you go throughout all of Southern Africa. And when you start re realizing how many of these gold mines we actually have, this whole thing becomes absolutely amazing. This is just an aerial shot of the, the, some of these gold mines I'm going to show you now. There are two different kinds of gold mines we're dealing with here. The adit mines that go into the side of the mountains, high up, uh, normally no, uh, near the crest of the mountain, in the rocky areas. And then obviously the normal gold mines that go down into the ground, which we probably won't see because of the flood and the sedimentation. So let's first see if we can recognize some. These are some of the examples of the added gold mines that have been recently opened, and I believe that wherever they're gold mines, they, you know, as you can see, oh, let me just show you this slide again. You can see stone circles, terraces, stone circles, all connected together via, uh, via terraces, and all along that ridge there, that's where you get all these gold mines. <clears throat> this is what they look like. Some of them, or many of them, have been reopened in the 1800s with the gold rush we had in South Africa. Um, just some examples. The day that I went up there, I walked through at least 30 of these. And then, for those of you who like orbs, there's a little treat. Inquisitive fellas. Um, in 2005, a geological company in Pumalanga, South Africa, did a, started a survey on behalf of, uh, of I believe it's Anglo-American, um, or one of the big mining companies because they felt they wanted to close up these gold mines, these adit mines, to prevent illegal gold mining. Well, they counted um, for five years, and in the mid-2010, they stopped counting when they realized it was going to be financially unrealistic.